Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord has been given to me, for he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to captives, and to the blind new sight, to set the downtrodden free, to proclaim the Lord's year of favour. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have brought your spirit to bear upon our world. We thank you, Lord, that you share your spirit with us and among us. We ask now, Lord, that you would touch our words and our hearts, that we would discover you in our sorrow and in our pain, that we would open our hearts to you, that you would embrace us in our pain, that you would bring healing, indeed, holiness. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I entitled this talk, The Who, What, When, Where, Why, and How of Healing. And I entitled it that because I didn't know what the heck I was going to talk about. A lot of questions. I hope we have a couple of answers. I'm going to be as interested in this talk as you are because it was uh, a topic that I thought was so much to be said and probably any of you could give a talk on healing simply because it's something that's hopefully part of our daily life. How did I ever get interested in healing? I wonder. When I was in the seminary, I probably was the second year I think I was professed, yeah, probably towards the end of the second year. And uh, the new lot of jobs came up on the wall. You know, it was always very interesting to see what new job you had to do in the seminary and different works that were there. And I looked down the list and sure, look after the cars, I could handle that, wash the cars, I could handle it, because I used to be a bus mechanic, you know. I could do that. And I think there was um, look after the stores and, and the goods that came in to distribute to the poor. And I thought, oh, that's a good job, I don't mind doing that. And then the last one was infirmarian. Well, not being a Latin scholar, even though I'd studied it for something like four years in high school, and since then I probably studied another three years, and after seven years of Latin in my life, I can say, Dominus Fabusco. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, here's this word infirmarian. I thought to myself, what the heck's that? Sounds a bit scary. So I asked one of the more senior members, I said, what's an infirmarian? He said, oh, that's the person who looks after all the sick people. I said, yeah, what have I got that job for? So I went along to the superior at the time and I said, I said, I'm up there as an infirmarian. I'm just wondering, what does that mean and what does it entail? And he explained to me that when someone's sick, that I have to sort of look after them and take them what they need and care for them and just be there for them and, and generally you know, help out along the way. I said, oh, okay. A bit strange, why did you pick me? He said, well, it's like this. He said, we knew that your mother was a nurse. We knew that you've got three sisters who are medical nurses. And you've got another sister who's a dental nurse. So we decided that you were the closest thing to medicine we had. <laughs> okay. That was my first brush with healing the sick. <laughs> I think a number of you would have heard the story of the man who was uh, very, very sick, went to see the doctor. And his wife went with him, you know, genuinely concerned. They went in to see the doctor and uh, he had these series of tests that they did and they came back. And he said, look, he said, do you mind waiting, the man, do you mind waiting in the waiting room for a moment? I just want to speak to your wife. That's okay. So she went in and she had a little bit of trepidation. And he said, well, it's like this. He said, you know, he, he has got a, a disease and illness, but if, if you're prepared to, you know, care for him, he won't die. But if you don't care for him, look, I don't give him very long. In fact, he might even last the month. Yeah. And she said, wow. So what do I have to do, Doc? Well, first thing in the morning, I want you to really start to show your love. Breakfast in bed, care for him. Look up, whatever he needs, you do for him. And uh, like, you know, all those beautiful things of marriage, you know, it's just give everything to him and continually dote on him and give him all these 
favourite foods, and if you do that, I'm sure he's going to survive and probably will even flourish. So after they got out to the car park, and the husband talked to the wife, and she said, what did the doctor have to say? And she said, prepare for death. <laughs> Some of you have seen them before. All it is is a, um, a diagnostic chart as you go through the um, Catechism of the Catholic Church, the section on the commandments. I just put it in a very abbreviated or brief form so that you can look at the various numbers. It's only a checklist. It's not to give anyone scruples. You just say, well, look, and the interesting thing when you use this, you go down and say, oh, yeah, haven't done that, haven't done that, haven't done that, haven't done that, haven't done that. Mm, I don't know. Haven't done that, haven't done that, haven't done that. <laughs> how much you don't do. It's very positive. Some people look at it in a negative way. They say, oh, these are all the sins. We're not all about sin, we're all about freedom. And when we have this, you have absolute freedom. So, take one if you wish. Repentance on the run, because it's not when we're running away from God, it's when we're running to God. But the thing about it is, like, if you try to read the Catechism, it's about that many pages. Like, how many numbers? It's about two, two, five... You know, it's about a thousand numbers, 1,200 numbers. So that's a lot of reading. So that's abbreviated for you. We're going to continue where we left off the, the who, what, when, where, and why, and how of healing. We looked at the Old Testament. We looked at the power of the commandments in keeping us sort of free from sin. And that's pretty positive. You know, it's much better to, like I used to be in maintenance. And we talk about preventive maintenance. We talk about wellness healing today. Doing those things which keep us healthy and strong and avoiding the things that are detrimental to us. And so as we do those things, of course, we can be sure that we're going to have, uh, you know, going along a bit more smoothly. Whereas if we don't do those things, then the danger is that we will really hurt ourselves, sometimes radically and even terminally, and therefore, you know, we would want to spare you that. So that's the advantage of God giving us what, what we call the director's or the maker's instructions. When you know the maker's instructions, you can travel more smoothly. I want to revisit some of the thoughts of today because it's part of the, you know, the, the what of prayer. It's very important that we understand that, as we had in this hymn, you when know, we sing these, it's song and we strong and constant. Okay, look down here. Through your pain you will discover me. Did we look at that before? Um, should you wander far from me, the commandments... I'll go searching for you in every land, so God's calling us back. Um, then you'll truly know me. When, see, often we only find God at our lowest depth, like the alcoholic. Unless he hits rock bottom, he doesn't start to go up. And that's why it's, there's a value in, 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 even in sin, like it humbles us to find God. Um, he's walking with us. Take your heart and give it to him. We really do have to hand ourselves over. Last night I mentioned in the talk on resting in the spirit that we really need to open ourselves to that and we saw that last night you know people resting in the spirit but we also saw that that inner resistance in some people you know they should have gone down but they didn't because it's frightening to let go give your heart to me it's like we've got to have our hands like this that's why sometimes people say they pray like this even the priests of mass are mandated to keep their hands out when they're praying you notice that some will keep them in here of course Others are out here. Some people are like this. You know, we all differ. But we have it like this because, you know, in our technological age, we know that we need to have a dish. Have you got a dish on your house yet? Okay. Until you get a satellite dish, you're not with it. <laughs> so we need to have our satellite dish with the arms right out to receive the blessing and the grace of God. And so when we come to, well, not, not when you come in to get praying for resting in the spirit because you'll knock the people down as you go, but at least, at least to have your hands, at least in that sense of, yes, I open my heart to you, Lord. So take your heart and give it to me. And you see, it's a free gift to the Lord. He's given you freedom. He's given you dominion over your soul. And then you need to surrender back to him. He won't take it in a way that is sort of um, by way of tyranny. When you know sorrow within your life, 
I will come. And you've all read at some stage in your life, you know, the footsteps parable. I would embrace your heart, and through your pain you will discover me. There's nothing wrong with pain. It's very important. And so the basic message of Christianity is through our pain, the pain of um, the fall, you know, really God does free us. And until we embrace that pain, because a lot of people are trying to run away from it, sometimes we can get hooked on um, appropriate medical drugs which are trying to free us from things that we won't face. And sadly, a lot of our sort of mental therapeutic means is really just a Band-Aid. And we know very well we need to get past that. Now, I'm not saying that medication's bad. In many, many cases it's necessary, certainly in the short term, to get the person back to an equilibrium so they can actually get some therapy or healing prayer. Healing prayer being the most preferable. So I'm not saying go off your medication. That would be the very wrong thing to do. Indeed, we read in the book of Sirach, the sensible person takes medications. So you've got a certain type of mental illness like schizophrenia, and they are very reluctant to take medication. But not only that, there's many other things too. Some people are reluctant to eat, like in anorexia. A different problem, different reasons. So the saving power of Jesus, he comes to free us. And once we become free, you are free indeed, says St. John. So, positive, give your life over to the Lord. A loving relationship. You know, nobody knows the Father except the Son. And those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him, Lord, reveal to me the Father, is a beautiful prayer. And then, of course, in receiving the Father, we receive the fullness of the Spirit. There are some obstacles in our life. We need to have those healed and freed. You know, it's all very well to say, oh, well, I'm going to have a conversion experience, and now I'm going to give my life to the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm saved. And we might do that at 32 years of age. But then go back, say, 10 years, and there's a lot of baggage over 10 years. And it's accumulative. There's nothing wrong with a grain of sand. Okay, you can handle a grain of sand, or a few grains of sand, unless you're naked in bed and you're on a sheet and it's scratching you. But if you get a truckload of sand on top of you, now you need a shovel to get it all off. I think sometimes this is this baggage, this accumulation of junk, or the dross of life that is upon us. And we really want to go to God with all our heart and all our mind, because we really have had a true conversion experience. We have jettisoned sin, we are longing for God, but there's something standing in the way. And that something standing in the way often needs to be healed. And God does gift us, the church, through Jesus, with the help to be able to get some of these things fixed. The message I want to give to you, first of all, the who of healing. Well, who does it? You do it. Every one of you. You. And you and you and you and you and you. And you. Everybody does it. In other words, we need to start to get into the mentality that this is something that Jesus has mandated. Let me give the last words of Jesus before he ascended into heaven. We have this in Mark's Gospel, chapter 16 and following, the very last paragraph. It says, they, um, Go out to all the world and teach the good news, proclaim the good news. For he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Important message. We've got to go.